I'm David Gribble, and this is a Cinematography Podcast. The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft, and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hey, Ben. Welcome back. Hey, Ilya. Welcome back to you as well. Sorry I missed you while you were in L.A. last week. Quite all right. I was also in Vegas the week before that. It's been a lot of travel for me lately. Not not too bad. Hey, and before we even get into it, we need to mention that we are still doing the book giveaway for Black Guy Dies First. I don't know why I'm showing it to you on Zoom. Nobody, nobody can see what I'm doing, but I'm holding the book up. Black Guy Dies First, Black Horror Cinema from Fodder to Oscar, written by Robin R. Means, Coleman, and Mark R. Harris, who was our interview last week. And I can confirm, Ben is holding up the book exactly like he said he was. He's, he's not just phoning that in. He's really holding it up for my benefit only, it appears. Yeah, just for your benefit. It is an awesome book. It's a fun read if you're a fan of film history, if you're a fan of horror films, if you uh, are interested in diversity and representation as a conversation that we've been having as a culture nonstop. But it, it's also like, it's not a scolding read. It's very entertaining. It's very funny and engaging and uh, full of cool stuff. And uh, even a whole chapter on terrible rap songs that took out horror movies. It's a really cool book. Mark is an awesome guy. It was great to talk to him. It was an awesome conversation. You know, we've talked to other authors like Judith Weston and stuff, but it was fun to talk to him, but also required a lot more research than I am used to doing as an interview. Oh my God, I had to read it. I had to make notes. Oh boy. Many, many years ago, I ran into Mark at Legoland and we had a whole conversation about horror films, which was a lot of fun. Nice. So Ben, who's on the show today? We have the legendary DP, David Gribble, and he has been around forever. It's one of those ones where, you know, he's he's done all these movies. If you're my age or, or older, you know, you, you grew up watching his stuff. I can't wait to hear it. And Ben, it's it's close focus. It's the beginning of the show. What is the topical thing? There's a lot of things that were going on. We had the uh, theater owners all got together in Vegas. Uh, the mm -hmm. Writers Guild, they uh, proposed the I the feel like rules. next week we're going to be talking about Writers Guild because, this, okay. the, because if they're going to go on strike, like the contract is up, I believe, next week. It, May 1st. May 1st yeah. is the day. So, yeah, it's about to so, happen. So uh, we might have more to say about that. Now, uh, it was actually something you posted on LinkedIn that I, I had seen other people post about it and, and it just kind of caught my eye. And it was, uh, I believe, a Variety or Hollywood Reporter article about something that Joe Russo, pretty big filmmaker, had said. Uh, and, and it's a quote that I, I thought would be interesting for us to discuss. And this podcast can be a time capsule of uh, how right I believe we are or how wrong we may turn out to be. And it was mm. him basically saying that within the next two years... AI will be such that uh, I could come home after a long day's work and tell the AI, I want to see a rom-com starring me and Marilyn Monroe, and the AI will write it and create it, and I'll just be able to watch a show starring me and Marilyn Monroe, and it'll it'll be photo real. it'll look like Marilyn Monroe was brought back from the dead, and I knew how to act, and all the writing would be snappy and funny, and it would be uh, a movie of the quality that Joe Russo is already known for making. And uh, to which I personally say, uh, horseshit. I call yeah. bullshit on that. That's not going to happen. But what say you? I'm with you in this camp. I don't think that's exactly verbatim what he says, but it's it's pretty close. And he was talking to another more consumer facing uh, website and then Variety picked up the story and they ran the whole thing. Mm. And he says two years is how long it was going to take for the AI to evolve the story and to do all kinds of stuff. And yes, there is a whole thing about Marilyn Monroe and the photoreal avatar and a rom-com. Look, I say that what he is describing there, uh, no, it's not two years, but is AI currently involved in lots and lots of aspects, particularly visual effects and mm -hmm. stuff that you're seeing right now and don't even realize it. Uh, he's way overshooting it. There is stuff happening right now 
today that is using AI. There's a whole film festival for AI. There's a, a Reddit post about some guy who claims to have used all these different tools to create a pizza commercial. So I'm going to say that what he's saying is going to happen in two years, BS, that's much, much further out. But to actually have AI- I, I, I'm going to go out on a limb single... and speculate that it is never going to happen. That's mm. never going to be a thing that happens. If I'm not mistaken, he's like imagining like full sound effects, full score, like it, I, it's a movie. I think that's exactly what- I will concede that I can see that happening, but happening in two years, absolutely not. A hundred percent not. A decade, two decades, much more likely. I I mean, 20 years out, I'd say that at the rate things are going and the the way that it progresses, I could see that happening. But that's that's a factor of 10. That's an order of magnitude different from from what he's talking about. Also, we're assuming that AI is going to continue. I mean, first of all, AI just means machine learning. Two years ago, we weren't talking about it at all. Last year, we were goofing around with Dolly Mini or whatever. We talked about it a little bit, and there was a great event uh, done by Digital Gorillas over at the ASC. I talked about that on the show, too, and how that was the first time I was ever fooled with, uh, you know, Mm. computer-created voiceover. One of the best conversations I had, it was a gentleman I know from a lens company called Lawa. His name's uh, Stephen Neff, and Stephen said to me that, you know, people are really worried about AI replacing their job. And the reality is, is that it's not the AI that's replacing your job. It's a person who's using AI replacing your job and the jobs of like 18 other people at the same time. That that's sure that is really where the the angle is here. It's not the actual AI itself. It's the uh, the human who will use the AI, And you could be that human using AI. It could could absolutely happen. Yeah, no. And I think that that's I mean, that's like when I first heard about chat GPT and like, you know, one of the things that they talked about was how it passed the bar with like a 90 percent somewhere. I don't know in which state. But and I was like, oh, lawyers are in trouble. And then the more I thought about it, it's like eh, legal assistants are probably in trouble. Like, you know, if a lawyer has to do a bunch of contract work, if you're a lawyer, would you just say, hey, chat GPT, make this contract between Ben and Ilya and then not look over it and send it off? No, the lawyer is going to need to go through and use their expertise and look at it. And I don't foresee a time ever. And I will I will eat these words. I will do like Werner Herzog and I will eat my shoe if we get to a point where it's like, oh, yeah, we don't we don't need lawyers anymore because we just use chat GPT for for or whatever the whatever the, the thing next is. thing is. Yes. Yeah. Like, I, I don't believe that that's ever going to be the case. And I feel like, <laughs> it's you know, chat I, GPT I, Esquire. Sorry. <laughs> ah, that's funny. Uh, and like, you know, some writers have been like concerned that you could tell it to write you an outline of a, an episode of Rick and Morty where, you know, they go to a planet and this and that happens. And then it writes an outline that you go, oh, that kind of looks like a Rick and Morty outline. But, you know, these things are all derivative Correct. of other stuff that already exists. Correct. And so by definition, cannot do anything original. And I've never really talked about this on here, but I sort of have a belief that like, you know, you look at music and music gets more and more produced, more and more produced, more and more produced. And then it's always cyclical. Some garage band comes out and blows everybody's mind with like, you know, the white stripes come out. It's literally two people and, and it's not really that heavily produced and everyone falls in love with it because it's real musicianship. And I'm not saying that AI art can't move you or can't uh, have a soul or like any other piece of art. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. I know. Yeah. But I but I mean like I think AI art can do a lot of stuff. I as everyone who listens to this or gets within 5 feet of me knows, I am constantly goofing around with Midjourney and and using it for AI art generation cuz it's fun. I think that AI, you can mark my words now, is going to be the re- responsible for shrinking of some crews. I think crews are going to get Agreed. smaller. I think the budgets will get lower. Uh, even lower than they are. I think it'll be a, a rise of more home production and home studios. Yeah. AI is not going to like pick up a light and move it across no, the it's not doing that. stage. It's not doing AI that. Is not, AI is not going to, you know, lay, lay grass down instead of your greensman. No, definitely and not. I, and I, I, I think, yeah, I think a lot of it's going to maybe be in post where AI is going to do some assistant editing work. Yeah. Yeah. And to a degree already does like already in Premiere. If I have a bunch of footage, I, I basically just tell Premiere to sync it and it syncs it. And uh, Isn't that you know, incredible? if I work, <laughs> that's totally incredible. But but we both know that the more AI or the more any technology does forget AI, the more any technology. I mean, think about like when competent titling was added to most of these nonlinear software things. Editors who were never graphic designers were suddenly thinking about fonts and sizes and underlines and and they had to. And the the editors who didn't who were like, no, I cut picture. That's what I do. They were all out of a job. 
And it, it's very, it's gonna... very timely though right now too. Like uh, there's a new uh, Peacock series, and uh, I know that we're going to be featuring one of the cinematographers from it uh, coming on the show recently. And so I've been watching it. It's called Mrs. Davis. I don't know if you uh, are familiar with Mrs. Davis, but the whole premise of that is that there is a single powerful artificial intelligence that kind of like runs and dictates every human's life on Earth. And this wasn't created by AI, but it's very, very timely right now. It was created, yeah. you know, uh, by by people sort of reflecting which, you know, a conversation you and I have had in the past is that I think horror and to a certain extent sci fi kind of reflects uh, fear. It re- reflects oh, fear yeah. at the time. And I definitely feel like Mrs. Davis is, despite it not being, uh, you know, particularly terrifying, there is definitely fear that went into the, the creative work here of people who are afraid of what AI is doing and where it is going and what how it will affect all of our lives. You really want to see something scary. Watch a special on AI military because all the countries are working on that right now. That's really scary. Mm. Yeah. That's creepy. So uh, let's set a date. And in two years time, let's see if Joe Russo is right. And it, it's it's right after my birthday. I'll remember. So yeah. 2025, if I'm able to, uh, you know, make a rom-com starring me and Marilyn Monroe, we'll be right here and I'll, I'll eat all the crow. I, I can't, but I'm te- I can't wait for you to say, I, I'm, I'm telling I, you, I proved you wrong there, Joe Russo. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure he'll, he'll come on the show and, uh, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and dress me down. No, but I will be happy to eat that crow because I think that that would be uh, an interesting development. But also, uh, I like people making my movies. So, hey, let's get to the interview with David Gribble. Here we go. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. I'm here talking across the planet from uh, California to Australia with. David Gribble, a.k.a. Gribbs. So we'll be calling you Gribbs for the rest of the interview. Uh, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. It's very exciting. You, you have such an interesting body of work and a lot of stuff that, that we've seen. So thank you so much. No worries, Mike. It's good to, good to have a chat to you. So let's back up, if we could, a little bit and talk about where you started. And we've interviewed Mandy Walker, and I was kind of talking to her about like a lot of what I know about uh, the Australian film industry. I got from a documentary called Not Quite Hollywood, which is sort of about the exploitation scene in Australia that was in the 1960s, really through the 1980s or beyond. But probably what a lot of people who aren't from Australia might not know is what a thriving film world Australia had back in that time. Now, did you go to film school or what was your entree into making films? Well, I come from Brisbane, which is not, it's, it's like one of the northern states. It's like uh, like going south in America. And I sort of was good at drawing. And I was going to be in maybe a, a job my dad had sort of heard about through the union and uh, as a draftsman assistant and somebody else who had a better connection got the job. So dad took me to an unemployment place and the guy goes, no, it's, it's a bit of a recession at the moment. There's nothing. Uh, are you interested in photography? Just out of the blue, he said, right? Mm-hmm. And I go like, yeah, I was always wanted to buy one of those home developing outfits on Kodak, you know? So he says, oh, not far from where you live, there's a, a company, and they were talking to me the other day, they might need an assistant. So, okay, so I go and see this guy. The guy shows me through everything. I go, this is good. And he said, ah, it's fine. you'd have to go to photography at night, you know, school. So I go, yeah. And uh, he said, oh, but I can't definitely tell you you've got the job until my brother comes back because we're a partnership. So I started the, of course, the course at night and I never ever got the job because the other brother, one brother would come back and the other one would say, what? And no, he's away now. We kept going on for ages. <laughs> Once I got under the, the bug of photography at the course, I'd go, oh man, I want this. You know, this is what I want to do. And I uh, just got an office job and every day at lunchtime, I would, pick up the phone book and I'd ring photographers. Hi, I'm David Gribble. I'd like to have a go. Hi, you know, yeah. I get to and start at the top again. You know, it wasn't a big town. And, and one day I rang and the guy picked up the phone. He was just yelling to a guy saying, you're fired. And he said, yes, what do you want? I said, I want a job. And he said, right, you've got the job. <laughs> so I went and worked with this guy. <laughs> right, this is my end of the industry, right? So I went and worked with this guy. He's Danish, crazy Dane, storytelling, like Hans Christian Andersen, I believed everything he said, but he had a really good setup and processing and a really gung-ho attitude. And uh, so I was assisting him and then it started to go bad and I wasn't getting paid. And I liked my job so much, I gave him my home savings. <laughs> I, oh, wow. To, I used to steal money from my mother's purse to get to work. <laughs> 
because I was not, not have no money and I'm giving my money to run the company under the guise of I'll, I'll have a projector as guarantee, right? So of <laughs> course it all went crazy. He left to go to Sydney. I'm left, I go and get a job in a camera store knowing that I like the cameras, but I'll hate selling to people. I'll never get hooked in there. And I saved up enough money for an airfare, a three-piece suit, pay back all the money I stole from my mother, and I flew to Sydney, you know. I sort of got a, a job at a studio that he was, you know, working at. He was a bit of a bullshit artist. I don't know what he told, what they, he told him about me, but there's a whole bunch of nice people there. You know, Peter James, I don't know if you've spoken to Peter James, uh, Russell Boyd, we all uh, from this one studio. It was a really, really good place to be. What kind of stuff were they making? Mostly commercials, some big commercials, and that's where the money, cigarette commercials, where they spent the money. So you got to work with big gear and stuff like that. Well, I mean, so how quickly between when you got to Sydney, how quickly did you become a DP or were you working in the camera department? It was department. usually about like seven years you'd be a, a, an assistant of some sort. Mm -hmm. They did a couple of films, right? A Japanese Western I've worked on as a camera assistant to go as an extra camera. Sometimes I didn't finish till like, you know, one in the morning and you had to oh, get up man. at three. But that was a good grounding, you know. I wouldn't give that up, that memory up. And that, because of that, I sort of then went, okay, I'm going to want to move into some operating. And uh, I told a cameraman once, oh, you know, if you ever hear, see of an opportunity, someone wants one, put my name in. And then they rang up and um, I went to operate on Skippy. You know, having a good career as a focus puller, I just felt as though I needed to step up. And when I, when I went my very first day on Skippy operating, I was used to having what I did for people, assisting. So I'm going like, who's going to do the Zoom? Uh, you are. But I'm operating and doing my own Zoom. Oh, shit, really? And then the <laughs> director, uh, the English director goes, we start on the mic and we're going to just snap Zoom out, right? To, and it's the full range of a Zoom, right? And it's virtually an impossible shot to operate, right? So this is my first shot on my first day. And I'm fucking up, right? And Peter Menzies had given me, the senior who'd given me the job is looking, you know, and so he goes, give me a go, right? And he goes in, he goes, no, 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 zap, okay, boom, right, let's print it. And I look at him, I go, yeah, but the director said go to 12 mil and you only went to 18. That's why you didn't get the lamps in the, in the shot. He goes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I go, oh, do what works. Don't necessarily <laughs> do what the director says. <laughs> so that was a big lesson on my first day operating. You know? From then That's on, amazing. it was easy. Now, at this point, were you already setting your sights on becoming a cinematographer or were you uh, just interested in working in the no, camera department? I really liked operating and I still do. Oh, I sort of moved in. I guess I don't know how it really happened. Uh, I think I decided that at a certain day, that's it, right? Mm -hmm. And that was pretty tough because I went six day, six months without a day's work. And eventually people started going, God, he must believe he can do it. If he's knocking back, I'm knocking back all this other work, mm -hmm. even operating, I had to knock back because, you know, that was like not stepping up to the cinematography. And I guess I started doing some little doco things, you know, out in the mining areas for people. And I did some TV drama thing and it just went from there. I, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about that not quite Hollywood uh, period of filmmaking in Australia, where it seems like there was a lot of very inventive filmmaking, out of which we end up getting people like, well, George Miller maybe is, is one of the best known, but there are you know a lot of humongous filmmakers and cinematographers come out of that period. And what I remember from that documentary was... For instance, uh, there was a scene in one of the movies where they had to drive a car through a house, so they drove a car through the house. And you said that you'd worked on uh, The Man from Hong Kong, the Brian oh, yeah. Trinchard Smith movie, where uh, notoriously uh, George Lazenby was actually lit on fire in slow motion. A lot of that... people wanted to do that to him, then. <laughs> <laughs> After the but Bond it's... movie. I actually like that Bond movie. But, well, no, um, he was such an ass, evidently. I oh, really? I got in England not long after, and they were telling me, oh, man, that guy. It just went to his head. But, um, but it seems like certainly it was more dangerous, but it also opened up the world for crazy inventiveness in, in the kind of work that you would do. Yeah. Uh, did you find that that was touching any of the kind of work that you were doing at the time? Well, it's funny. Then at that time, I don't know whether we looked upon it as what you're describing, you know? It was 10 BA, which is a tax incentive for dentists or doctors, anybody with excess money could feed it into a film 
get their credit mm-hmm. as a producer and it would be a tax, total tax write-off, right? Oh, really? So if they had any excess money, that's why all those movies came like that. So that's why scripts were getting stamped and crazy ideas were, were getting done, you know? So therefore, a lot of films are getting made that probably weren't thought out totally. Uh, so that's why they could be a bit crazy to be, to be shot. Uh, and I did a film called Running on Empty, which was probably still in that era, but is now like a real cult film for car people because the director insisted there wouldn't be any like Hollywood or movie cars. There would have to be real cars that did what they're supposed to do and then the producers had to spend money on them. Yeah. And there's still, like, there's some festival now at the country town we shot in that they, every year they have this running on empty damn thing and there's thousands of people turn up with their cars and so that was part of the feed down from the 10 BA things. Mm-hmm. So you would, ch- it sounds like, you know, cause like looking at your filmography, it's mostly the feature stuff that you worked on, but it sounds like you did a lot, a lot, a lot of commercials. Yeah. I used to balance it. I, I, it'd be like maybe two years doing commercials. Then I'd do a movie and it was a mm-hmm. balance. Cause I, my theory was that, uh, commercials were, were like a one night stand and movie was like a relationship. You needed both. Yeah. <laughs> so at a certain point though you started working on bigger features and features that were getting a little bit more out of australia and, and uh, getting a little bit more worldwide acclaim or worldwide notice what was the tipping point for you in terms of of shooting those kinds of features i did a movie called monkey grip which was nominated in australian awards the next morning after a big night out i got a phone call sydney fury you know sydney fury I know looked him up. He's done so many. And I, it just sounded like a fake name to me. And I thought it was a grip bringing me up and trying to wire me up. I'm from Hollywood. And I, I you know, this sort of stuff like, I'd like you to do my next movie. I saw what you did. And I go, yeah, fucking great. And I hung up on it. <laughs> <laughs> but then he rang back. It convinced me. So I did um, a film in Bangkok, Willem Dafoe and Gregory Hines. That was off. The movie was off limits, right? Yeah, yeah. I saw going off limits. So, uh, so that I worked with a minimum of gear there. I guess they were impressed with that. Then that sort of moved me on to a movie I loved working on tap, you know, Gregory Hines tap dancing. Because Gregory liked, liked how I lit him in the war movie. So he insisted upon I would go. I was wondering if there was a connection between that because, you know, Gregory Hines was a huge, I mean, it's hard to, people don't remember him as well now, but he was a humongous star in the 80s. And, and that you shot two of his movies virtually back to back. Yeah, now he, he liked the way he looked, you know, because I kept, I, my theory is uh, I'm lighting faces, not places, you know. If there's mm-hmm. a, a cathedral, and, and this is a good way for a, an experienced cameraman to start, to light a cathedral, well, you, where are the people? Uh, okay, they're going to be up near the thing there, and that's where the dialogue is, and you think about that first. You know, let's light up all these candles. Okay, but that's, and then you, as you think about that, you work out the wider part of it. You don't start going crazy with big guns pointing through unless you need it, you know? Uh, mm. And so I like faces, so faces are important to me. Uh, so Willem Dafoe, like on that particular film, I would give him, if you want an actor to hit a light, you know, you have to give them incentive. You don't have to, don't tell them. If it's a beautiful wo- female actress and she's, this is the spot and you go, and just, you just go, wow, you look great here, man. You look mm. really good in this spot. You walk away, you don't say hit that spot. She'll be in that spot. <laughs> well, Van Damme, you say, oh, man, your muscles are great here, man. Wow. What a, yeah, this is a spot. He would hit that per millimeter, you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you've got to use uh, different me- methods. Like in, with Willem, I'd say one particular scene, I'd put a little beam of light. And <clears throat> I said to him, in front of your face, about six inches in front of your face is a bit of light going through. Whenever you want to make uh, a statement, a bit more in your dialogue, you lean forward, the light will help you, you know? It'll accent mm. those words. So he will always do the same, see? You know, if you say, you know, it, don't, it won't be out of continuity. It'll always be that he moves into the light. So you can different takes, you can cut. But if you just put it there on him at any time uh, and you just have to be lucky that you would get it, you know? 
That's interesting that you would say that. Uh, there's, uh, well, I have the DVD for seven, and I watched it with commentary, and one of the commentaries was Morgan Freeman, and he was saying that Fincher was one of the few directors where if he said, stand here and you'll be in the light, uh, he would do it, because most of the other time, he'd, if, if he was standing one place and they say, well, if you walk over here, you'll be in the light, he's like, well, you got to move your light. And I think what, what you're describing is really interesting to me, because it's, it's not something you think of, like you think of a cinematographer lighting and lensing and all that stuff, but you're talking about sort of the politics of working with actors which you know is directing the actors is the director's job but you're giving the actors tools to make themselves look better or to look like what they want to look like on screen can you talk a little bit about that i don't know that we've ever had anyone discuss specifically how they work with actors in this way well it's um american actors of course are different you know they're trained mm-hmm. differently and i figured they've been beaten up on the way up you know a lot That's of them have been twisted and beaten up when they got there, man, they wanted the four trailers. They wanted this. They wanted <laughs> that, right? And a lot of them were probably difficult to work with in that instance, you know, because they hadn't been treated properly by producers and that, you know. I guess Australian and British actors are brought up from stage, maybe from like world's fastest Indian, right? Anthony Hopkins. Wouldn't matter what happened, he would give the same performance, right? Mm-hmm. If someone jumped up and down over there. But you may, on an American film, it's American. If someone walked in an eye line, cut, 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 cut. So it was, it's a different discipline you had to be aware of in America to be, if, you know, I might be adjusting a light at the last minute, just a little, you have to be really wary, uh, almost like doing it when they're looking away. Uh, <laughs> but, but with Anthony Hopkins, in the end, I had to remind the crew, I said, fellas, can you shut up or something? Let the actor... You know, I had to bring a little bit of the Americanization into that film because everyone was just going in New Zealand, particularly. Everyone was just like taking liberties, you know? You know, well, actually, he did it. I was surprised that Roger would do a lot of takes. Roger Donaldson. Donaldson, right? Does a, uh, quite a lot of takes, you know? Uh, in fact, you know, in Cadillac, he did a lot of takes. How many takes is a lot of takes in your book? 60. That's a lot of takes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, and for someone like, Anthony Hopkins, you wouldn't think you'd need a lot. And then I remember on Cadillac, man, I'm thinking, I've done it with, with commercial directors too, because they do a lot of takes, right? And you, you're thinking, what is he after here? Is he trying to tire the actor so that he will give him what he wants? Or is it just that thing, I want all these choices in the editing? But usually you get so many in the editing. By the time the assistant editor goes through there and picks stuff and, you know, because everyone's busy, you probably don't even really get to choose through them all, you know? I used to even ask as, an op- as a cinematographer operator, when you were, you know, you were looking at something or a commercial uh, thing, you'd go, one for me. Can I just have one take for me? And mm-hmm. I love working with a zoom, not to zoom, but to change a size, mm-hmm. you know, between a move or be a different size or just one more take, I'll do it tight. And it'll cut in perfectly. It's like, actually, I used to pick that up on television commercials. You have like a beach party dialogue or something. Run in handheld, cover everything, step back on a dolly of the tender one zoom and milk it up, find the shots you want within there. You can cut that stuff anyway and you do it really efficiently, you know? And that's yeah. a good technique to bring over to films. Sometimes it, there's that story about like the director arrives on set and he can't quite work out what he wants to do. So he makes the grips lay an 80 foot track. Because <laughs> 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 it's going to take a while and then the director works out what he wants to do. <laughs> Yeah, but now you gotta now you gotta shoot an eighty foot track. Yeah, yeah, but you know, yeah. I would just use the last bit at the end. <laughs> I've had that. You would just shoot the last ten feet. So, Cadillac Man is is a movie that I have seen a bazillion times because I believe I was in high school when that movie came out, and it played at a movie theater that I was working at. Oh, Cadillac Man, yeah, yeah. And when you're talking about doing a lot of takes. Working with an actor like Robin Williams, I imagine he was extraordinarily improvisational is what he was known as. But in that particular movie, I also re- recall he was the least Robin Williams-y he'd ever been in a movie at that point. Well, it like wasn't very- because it wasn't shot. We, I maintain you could go back there now to the footage and cut something really crazy, you know? He would just, like he normally does, he would rattle off onto stuff, you know? And make everyone laugh, but not on the script, not in the script, you know. But there's stuff in there. You could go through that. It would make a great something else. <laughs> but he, uh, yeah, he would just, 
go crazy, you know? Well, that that actually seems like that must be an occupational hazard to have worked with Robin Williams because he's such a live wire. But that's, you know, also what he brought to the screen was sort of a living energy that, you know, like it was kind of irreplaceable. I always maintained there was way too much yelling in that movie. Mm hmm. Well, it's about angry people. Yeah, yeah. And but almost, it's almost, it's, it's, it's damn near a stage play, though, because the whole thing takes place, not the whole thing doesn't take place inside the car lot, but like so much of it does that you could almost, it's almost one location for a lot of it. Well, you know, you can imagine trying to shoot it and you like, you don't like flat lighting and Roger's got a steady cam, uh, <laughs> you know, and you're going like up against a wall. Oh, no, up against a wall. And the good thing is they made the wall like carpet, so it flattened out and made it a bit dark around them. But they're all huddled around one corner and go, oh, my God. It was, yeah, it, it was a bit of a, a stage play. We come back again to that scene the next day. We've done 34 takes yesterday. and Roger wants to uh, maybe reslate it a different number, but it's the same <laughs> setup. So I guess so the producers don't see you doing 60 takes with Robin Williams. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it, it was a bit of a stage play. I mean, it didn't do as well as it should have, I think. At the, I think it did really well. In the video hire situation, mm -hmm. from what I, I can gather. Well, it's one of those movies, and I find it always interesting when you take a location like a car dealership, it's not an inherently cinematic place, but you're telling a very cinematic story, and you are having to find a cinematic way into that. How did you go about doing that? Well, I, I went for at least I want the cars to look good as they come in the background. That's why I had the lights over the light boxes over them. And there's a lot of glass everywhere. So you're using big frames. I was going, shit, I'm going to see all my bloody lighting in here. I don't yeah, want to use yeah. hard light. I still want to have it soft light. And you try to get the modeling when you can. And the steady cam, it's hard sometimes if, if Roger goes everywhere, 360. Uh, so it became an exercise in sort of avoiding reflections and to try to get this performance, you know, mm -hmm. uh, against all odds, really. And it was Robin Williams, really. And Tim Robbins. I mean, honestly, like that, that movie has so many strong actors in it. Fran Drescher is in that movie. Oh, yeah, like, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Tim Robbins. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he always offered me a, a joint after rap uh, back in his trailer, but I was on a low budget. Things why I never got to have a joint with Tim Robbins was because I had to always get a lift home. Oh, you got <laughs> Yeah, you got to think of all those things. <laughs> Some of the more recent stuff that you've done, you shot a series of uh, movies with Tom Selleck that were uh, Jesse Stone uh, things. Uh, what can you tell me about those? Yeah, I love shooting there. Robert Harmon is a favorite director of mine. We get on really well. We both like Shadow. Is that the same uh, guy who directed The Hitcher? Yeah, that's correct, with Johnny Seal. Oh my God, that is like one of the, that to me is like one of the best thrillers ever made. Yeah, no, he, he's a, a good friend of mine. I was just talking to him the other day, you know, and he likes that sort of moody lighting. I remember on a Van Damme movie, The Quest, we had, uh, there's two things. One, at the end of the picture, the, the producers are going, we want to save some money, save some money. We've got to send back all the lights. Uh, I said, well, no, no, okay. Well, we don't need the tungsten lights now because we've got daylight stuff. Okay. Or the big last scene with the dirigible and the fight scene is all day on the top of this hill village. Yeah, okay, fine. Send back all the lights, right? Next day. Oh, we're changing that scene tonight. <laughs> oh, man. So. And the big lights are no use because it's on a hill. You can't put a light anywhere. So I got a uh, the gaffer, took apart one of these big nine lights and took each bulb, wired it up, and they were just for little things. But mainly for the fight, which is flame lit, I had a 10-foot tower. We got a follow spot, and I would just have a piece of poly with hot side and a flat side, you know? And I would say, follow me with the spotlight. And you would be following the, the fight, you know, boom, boom, but you flick it off, flick it on. And you might have a gaffer with another, flick it over to him, you know, go over to him. You know, you would just, because the fight was free form, there was no like, nowhere, you didn't know where it was going. So you had to do something like that. So when I look at it now, I go, gee, I would have loved to have played that with, with, <laughs> like that from the beginning, you know, it was a good lesson to, to cover a fight just by, by having a follow spot, follow a little bit of white poly. And didn't Van Damme direct that movie himself? Well, Peter McDonald uh, is a, like a second year director and he sort of took it over really. Uh, I oh, think got it. Jean-Claude would come in and, this is the hardest film I've ever done. <laughs> and he'd go home and we'd all keep shooting. But I do remember Jean-Claude would go, call me Bill. And I'd say, Bill. And I'd go, yeah, okay. And on the last day, uh, uh, the second last day, I said, hey, 
Jean Floyd, uh, tomorrow's the last day. Don't forget my name tomorrow. It's David, right? And he <laughs> came to, he looked at me and he's going, I wanted to talk to you about something. He went, oh, uh, uh, and walked away. He couldn't remember my name. <laughs> So uh, tell me a little bit more, though, about the, the Jesse Stone stuff that you did, because you've done several of those. Oh, Jesse Stone, yeah, okay. It's, it's really about selecting uh, locations, I think, those sort of films, and the color of the walls. But on <laughs> Jesse Stone, there's a monster of a location, which is the uh, headquarters of that thing, and it's like four stories at the back. So to light the damn thing, any adjustments, you've got man lifts out there, moving things around and stuff. Other locations, you just pick it on nice window positions you know the french new wave came in and it was all this great stuff but it was always fucking badly lit bounce a light off the ceiling if i had one light i wouldn't waste it off the, on the ceiling i'd put it through the window and convince the actors or the director to be around the window right so i always try to uh, position i'll shift desks i'll rotate them cheap yeah continuity people are going like what are you doing you'll never know you never see it and and so that the light works from the window you're running off, making people pan left, pan right, come back. You are constantly changing the shot, but usually the lighting is right. And I, my, my principle is like work with a broad brush and shoot before you're ready, you know? <laughs> it's TV. You've got to shoot before you're ready. Don't indulge yourself too much. But these new lights are fantastic. These little bloody LED lights. You can point to a guy and go like 10% and no one's moving on the set, you know? Or you can walk yes, by yourself. You can just do it on, a, on an app on your iPad. Oh, yeah. Well, that, that's, that's it. You're probably too busy with all the uh, camera frames on your iPad. <laughs> oh, I love that getting your rushes on the iPad. Man, that's good. Yeah, it used to be the whole method of waiting for the producers, waiting for everyone to come to rushes, and you, you're thinking, oh, man, I want to get home and eat something and go to sleep. But now you, then you take home your iPad, all of yesterday's rushes, look at it, get on the phone, get on Skype to, to Robert, and we'd chat through the rushes. Well, we're cooking something, you know, quite civilized. Crazy. That's awesome. Well, I think that's an excellent place to leave it. Thank you so much for coming on here. Is there any place online where people can either see your work or even reach out to you, interact with you, Twitter, Instagram, any of those things? Yeah, I'm on Instagram uh, as Gribshot, G-R-I-B-S-H-O-T-T. And on Facebook, yeah, David Gribble, ACS. I think I still got a website. But, you know, you keep... Changing and I go, I must change that. How long ago? Oh, 10 years. God, I haven't changed. That is the story of every cinematographer. There isn't a single DP who's like, hey, my website's completely up to date. Every single one we have on here is like, our website, my website, I haven't touched it in five years. You get too busy to adjust it. And when you're slow, you go like, what the fuck? You know, (laughs) I have that problem of my demo reels used to be like in, you know, pneumatic tapes. You go to Hollywood, you meet some people, you show them your reel and I go, yes, yes, uh, but what do you do? I said, well, uh, I did like aerials underwater. You know, one day I did aerials underwater and steady cam in the same day on some shoots, and you have and moody lighting and da 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 da. No, like, yeah, yeah, but what do you do? I said, I'm a cinematographer. I do the job <laughs> that you say. You know? <laughs> and they wanted to categorize you, and that was a bit of a problem trying to slot me into for doing commercials and certain. Oh, do you do hair? Yeah, I've done hair. Yeah. Do you do food? Yeah, I don't have any of that in my reel. It drove me crazy, but I do it. You know, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Now I wish I kept that food stuff, man. <laughs> <laughs> Sit in a room shooting food. <laughs> Those are long days. Thank you so much again for coming on here, and hopefully we can get you back at some point. And uh, I, I, I feel like we could talk to you for four days about this stuff. This is so. Those are some amazing stories. Just one final word. I always maintain that I would give it up when doing good looking pictures and working fast goes out of style. (laughs) So I'm still working. Cool, well thank you so much. No worries, nice to chat to you. All right, so that was David Gribble. Thank you so much, David, and uh, sorry that your interview somehow got shuffled. Yes, well I'm glad it was unearthed and uh, everyone got to hear it. Hey, guess what time it is, Ben? What time? It is the bill paying time. We have, we have to thank our good friends over at Aperture, a maker of fine lights for the motion picture and television industry. They had a couple of new lights actually come out during NAB that are 
part of their Amaran line, which are actually their, their lower cost, uh, some, some of them are lower cost lights. One of them is called the Amaran 150C, and it's a 150 watt RGB WW light. So it gives you any sort of color that you might want in the spectrum uh, with using red, green, and blue LEDs to make, make all kinds of colors, plus two different white chips, one that's a daylight balance and one that's tungsten or warm white balance. And uh, it's an incredibly powerful light. It retails for $359. Whoa. And yeah, it's compatible with uh, Bowen's mounts and uh, you get an AC power supply with it. And there is a 48 volt DC power input, but most people don't have 48 volts. 48 volts is some big, big batteries. So for I think 99% of people out there, this is an AC power input system. It's really, really bright and really, really colorful. Uh, there is a ton of features that you can look up actually over at hotrodcameras.com. Of course, Hot Rod sells the Amaran lights. And the 150C, I think, is going to be a really big mover. I think a lot of people are going to like it because it's very inexpensive and it's a full color light and it's uh, super, super lightweight. Sweet. And now, short ends. So, Ben. It's our short end time. What's your short end this week? Um, my short end in honor of uh, the number two movie of the week, Evil Dead Rise. Mm. I am, to no one's surprise, a huge fan of the Evil Dead series, but often people will be like, what's the most perfect horror series ever? You know, is it Friday the 13th? Is it Nightmare on Elm Street? You know, what is it? And I always say Evil Dead. Evil Dead, mm. in my opinion, in the they've made five movies and a TV series. There's never been a wrong note. And it has spanned the gambit from edgiest horror that you can have, which I believe Evil Dead Rise kind of fits into that. It's like a very dark, very intense funhouse kind of a story. And most of them are to Army of Darkness, which is like Three Stooges level silly with monsters in it and everything in between. Evil Dead 2 is probably my favorite, which I saw in the theater. I snuck in to see it in a theater when I was too young to see it. And that movie was released unrated, so it wasn't even like getting into an R-rated movie. Like, you had to be 17 or 18 to even go in, and I was not that old. Uh, to me, that one's always going to be my favorite. Uh, shot by Peter Deming, I believe. And it's just a brilliant world. And I think with the success of Evil Dead Rise, we're going to see more Evil Dead movies coming out. I'll be interested to see them. But what I appreciate it more than anything is that, and they've been made by multiple studios have made them, like this one I think was released by New Line, but Universal put out Army of Darkness. Like, you know, they've been all over the place. But there have been three people who are the tip of the spear of this franchise, and they are Sam Raimi, who directed several of them, Robert Tappert, who produced all of them, to my knowledge, and Bruce Campbell, who starred in all of them, except for there was kind of a reboot in 2013 just called Evil Dead. And this one, Bruce Campbell wasn't in either of those, but he's a producer, I believe, on both. And these guys get this aesthetic, and uh, I, I don't know how they've managed to hold on to it all these years and not have it, you know, bought up by a studio and not given back to them. But what I appreciate is knowing that no matter what version of this we see, it's from them. There's a wonderful piece of video of uh, Bruce Campbell yelling, you know, telling some dude off, I believe it's South by Southwest, where like somebody just decided to troll them after a screening of Evil Dead Rise. I think it was South by, but it could have been a different festival. And everyone in that audience had had a great time seeing the movie. And this one guy went up to ask them a stupid question. Uh, and it was sort of like, why does your movie suck? Like something stupid like that. And it was fun watching Bruce Campbell, you know, who is a, a dignified man, uh, just, you know, read this guy the riot act. But uh, Evil Dead Rise, definitely worth seeing. I saw it in the theater on my birthday. It was uh, my uh, wife's birthday present to me was we got to go see that, which is a movie I definitely wanted to see in the theater. But as a whole franchise, to me, it shows like if you have an aesthetic and you come up with an idea that can be kind of a universe, you can have something that's like dark, straight up horror. You can have wild slapstick comedy. And in fact, Evil Dead 2 to me has like both of those in, in abundance and all of the films and the TV show also all look great. Uh, I, I just can't say enough good things about it. And I'm glad to see that it's doing well. 
Yeah, I I feel like your wife knows you real well. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was that was her birthday gift to you. And I was never the big Evil Dead 2 fan. I appreciate it. I appreciate what it is. I appreciate the the first one as well too. But I'm not the the gung-ho Evil Dead fanatic the way you are, but uh I think it's awesome. I'm glad that they're still making it and that all of the extreme hardcore fans uh, have more to keep coming back to the franchise for. It's kind of like the uh it keeps going like uh like Star Wars. It's been going for yeah. so long. Yeah. Well, it's, it's sometimes think about it like, you know, you're, you're Sam Raimi or you're Rob Tappert and you're sitting on the set of Evil Dead Rise, you know, in 2023, when you your first movie you made when you were 19 was The Evil Dead. It's, it's like Paul McCartney in his 70s going up and having to play Love Me Do, which he wrote when he was, you know, 21 years old or whatever. Yeah. You know, it, there's a real audience for it. And uh, what I also love is that, you know, they've been allowed to change and grow with the times. We're not expecting them all to be the same thing. And it, honestly, if I even have one complaint about Evil Dead Rise, it's that there's maybe slightly too much fan service in it for me. Like, mm, I felt I yeah, felt like yeah. it could have done... Too many insider Easter eggs. Yeah, there's a few. I mean, like, you could get away with it to a degree. But there, yeah, it was just one too many where I'm like, eh, you don't need... This can live on its own. It doesn't need to hang its uh, hat on that stuff. But it's wonderful. It's a super fun house movie, and I hope people continue to see it. So, Ilya, what is your short end for the day? Uh, my short end, I'm going to keep it short and sweet. It is some lenses that you can't buy just yet, but there is a pre-order that's going to be over at uh, Hot Rod Cameras, and they are the Lawa Ranger full-frame cinema lenses. There's two of them in the series. There's a 28 to 75 and a 75 to 180. They're both T29, and they both cover full frame. Uh, we had the first, uh, very first lenses in the world that were finished uh, at our shop at our Lawa event uh, before NAB, and I got to put them on the projector and I got to look at them and they're really really nice there isn't an official price for them yet they're uh, rumored to be under five thousand dollars which is extremely high quality lenses and at that sort of price they're really a bargain compared to the other full frame cinema zooms that are out there and the rangers focal range of 28 to 75 and 75 to 180 represents a huge, huge amount of coverage that you can get from basically two lenses from all the way on the wide side and full frame at 28 to all the way 180 on the long. It's mm. really impressive. They come in PL mount. They also come with an interchangeable EF mount. And I'm just really blown away by these lenses. They're going to get compared a lot to the DZO Kata lenses, but uh, they're significantly smaller. And I think they're going to get compared a lot to the Tokina very fine 25 to 75 uh, zoom lens, which is brilliant for Super 35. But if you're working in full frame sensors, larger sensors, the 25 to 75, you got to add a doubler. You got to do something like that on the Tokina side. And so really these Lawas are going to be turning a lot of heads. And I predict that they're going to be pretty big for uh, people out there working in the full frame format. Excellent. Excellent. That's very cool. So Ben, where can people find you if they want to track you down? Please find me at benrock.com. And uh, so far, still on Twitter at Neptune Salad, a perfectly cromulent place to uh, reach out and say hello. Uh, you can find me over at Hot Rod Cameras, hotrodcameras.com. You need any gear for your uh, productions, or if you've got a studio that needs building, uh, hit us up. We're uh, we're actively doing that right now for some other folks. Also, Ben, let's thank some people. Oh, and before we thank some people, let's just do one more quick reminder about the book giveaway. Don't forget to go to our Instagram, go to our Twitter, go to our Facebook, like our most recent book giveaway contest post and enter and uh, you could end up with a free book autographed. Autographed by Mark Harris. That's right. So, Ben, uh, who do we have to thank this week? Uh, as always, we should uh, thank Ben Katz, who's been uh, cursing my name because I keep coughing, and hopefully uh, he's edited much of them out of the uh, out of the stuff. I don't know what's going on with the cough. Uh, we should thank Alana Cody, who is our diligent, hardworking producer. She's got us set up with a slew of interviews. I'm doing one first thing tomorrow morning, in fact, for another book, in fact. Ooh, nice. Very fun. And uh, lastly, but never leastly, let's thank our good friend, Kay's Alatracci, who composed every scrap of music that you've heard in this entire episode. You can find Kay's amazing work at musicbykays.com. Please reach out to him. Hire him to uh, score a thing for you. Come on. Some of you are filmmakers and you're making your own films, probably a lot of you, and you need a good score. Freaking reach out to Kay's. He's awesome. Yeah. AI doesn't quite do that yet. <laughs> K's. You, you, K's. K's, not replaceable K's by AI. Yeah. Wouldn't it be That's sad true. if uh, AI just suddenly was able to compose scores, color correct, and do visual effects? 
trust me, Kays will learn the AI for all of that. So that's <laughs> what will happen. So, All right. Well, Ben, I think that's just about going to do it. You want to take us out? Thanks for listening. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.